Sharks are publicly perceived today not only as one of nature's ultimate predators, but as movie monsters, man-eaters, ferocious beasts to be feared and avoided by people. The pop culture image of killer sharks is a complex phenomenon that is in some ways wildly exaggerated by fictional portrayals of these animals as monsters. But how far back does public fear of sharks extend, and what started this fear in the first place? Today, we'll be looking at a series of true historical shark attacks that irreversibly changed not only the public's perception of sharks, but also the scientific community's understanding of their behavior and their relationship with people altogether. This is but one history from the Seven Seas. Please be forewarned that this video contains graphic descriptions of shark attacks on people, but this is what really happened. Summer 1916. The northeastern United States is gripped by a heat wave and polio epidemic, driving troves of people to the already popular coastal beaches of New Jersey. Sharks weren't considered very dangerous animals to people at this point, and if you thought that they're little understood today, the biological details of these high-level predators were virtually unknown to scientists of the day. What little shark knowledge they had or thought they had mainly came from speculation. On Saturday, July 1st, 1916, a fateful incident would spark the beginning of America's first ever shark panic. The first attack took place at Beach Haven, located on Long Beach Island off southern Jersey. The victim was 28-year-old Philadelphia man, Charles Epting Vincent, who was staying at the luxurious Angleside Hotel with his family for a beach vacation. Before the Vincent family was to eat dinner on the night of July 1st, Charles opted to go for a swim just outside the hotel. Vincent befriended a Chesapeake Bay retriever on the beach, which followed him into the water. Only a short time after beginning his swim, Vincent began shouting and making a loud commotion. Present beachgoers initially thought he was shouting at the dog before realizing something much worse was going on and that Mr. Vanson was in a state of severe distress. They watched as the water around him began to turn red. Lifeguard Alexander Ott and bystander Sheridan Taylor swam out to Vanson's aid and found that something was latched onto his legs, preventing him from swimming away. Vanson struggled hard against the force trying to pull him beneath the surface and with the help of his rescuers, he finally broke free from its terrible clench. Although when they pulled him free, he suddenly felt much lighter. And as they brought the profusely bleeding Vincent to shore, Ott and Taylor were still followed by the very shark that had just perpetrated this attack, one that witnesses described being nine feet long. Vincent's legs were maimed. His left thigh was almost completely stripped of flesh. In a last-ditch effort to save his life, Vincent was taken back into the Ankleside Hotel, where his father, a doctor, desperately wanted to save his son. It was no use, however, and Charles Vincent was pronounced dead on the lobby floor of the Ankleside Hotel after suffering severe blood loss. Vincent would be the first ever recorded shark attack fatality in United States history. Although Vincent's shocking, violent death was publicized, New Jersey's beaches remained open. Sound familiar? Fishermen and ship captains working around the ports of Newark and New York City reported sightings of large sharks in the vicinity of New Jersey's waters, but these sightings were dismissed and ignored by officials. It was five days after Vanson's death when another shark attack took place on the Jersey Shore. Spring Lake was another tourist town, some 45 miles, that's 72 kilometers, north of Beach Haven and south of Asbury Park. 27-year-old Charles Bruder, a Swiss hotel worker was swimming just over 300 feet from shore when beachgoers reported hearing his agonized screams. Two lifeguards rushed to Bruder's aid in a lifeboat and found the water stained deep red by the time they reached him. They pulled him from the water, only to find that both of his legs had been severed and he had also suffered a large bite wound to the abdomen. Charles Bruder bled to death as the lifeguards took him to shore. The New York Times reported that beachgoers panicked and fainted at the sight of Bruder's mutilated body being brought ashore. Bruder's former co-workers, as well as guests at the hotel he worked at, would raise money to send back home to his mother in Switzerland. 
Widespread fear of sharks began to consume the East Coast United States as the two shark attacks repeatedly made front page news. Some people weren't convinced the attacks were perpetrated by sharks, suggesting they could have been caused by a large mackerel or even a giant sea turtle. The most bizarre conspiracy theories of the time suggested that the two deaths could have been caused by a German U-boat as World War I tensions simmered. The summer tourism industry suffered as people grew afraid of swimming, and some beaches took safety measures, such as erecting wire nets in their waters to keep large predators out, and even hired armed men as boat patrols. Many sharks were killed during this time, but upon being cut open and looked inside, none of them contained any human remains, only fish. The next attacks would happen just six days after Bruder's death on July 12, 1916. The site of the next attacks would be an unexpected one, Matawan Creek, near the New Jersey town of Keyport. Matawan itself was not a beach town like the previous two attack sites. Lying inland from Raritan Bay, Matawan had been characterized as being more like a Midwestern town than an East Coast beach resort. But despite Matawan being a very unlikely place for shark encounters, let alone deadly ones, they did happen. On July 12th, local Matawan resident and retired ship captain Thomas Cottrell reported an 8-foot or nearly 2.5-long meter shark swimming in the local creek, but no one believed him. Nonetheless, the old captain feared for the safety of his fellow townspeople and set out to the creek to warn anyone swimming of the danger at hand. Later that day, a group of young boys were playing in the creek at an area called Wyckoff's Dock. It was here that the boys saw in the water what they later described as an old, black weather-beaten board or a weathered log. The dark shape drew closer to the boys, and when its dorsal fin broke the surface, they realized they weren't looking at any driftwood, but instead, a large shark. The boys scrambled to get out of the water, but 11-year-old epileptic Lester Stilwell wasn't fast enough. There are several differing versions of what Lester's friends witnessed, with varying extents of what they saw the shark do to him. Although they all ended in the same tragic way, Lester was pulled beneath the water, and his friends were unable to help as he was mauled by the powerful shark. The boys ran for help and rallied several men to attempt to help Lester, or at least recover his body. One of the men who had come to help was local businessman Watson Stanley Fisher, 24 years of age, who dove into the creek in a bid to look for Lester. The men disbelieved the boys' account of a shark, and instead thought that Lester had suffered an epileptic seizure. Fisher searched and searched, but hadn't found Lester. He dove again, entering the creek's deeper waters, where he would make a shocking discovery. Fisher encountered the shark, still feeding upon Lester's dead body. Fisher hit the shark with his bare fists, managing to free Lester's remains from its mouth, but diverting the shark's attention to himself. Fisher managed to reach the creek's surface with Lester's body in tow, but was attacked and bitten by the shark in front of a now large crowd of onlookers. In the struggle with the shark, he lost Lester's remains. As the shark began to eat Fisher in front of the onlooking crowd, Fisher managed to grab a broken oar and beat his assailant with it. The shark let go, and he managed to escape to the creek bank. But just barely, Fisher wouldn't survive this deadly encounter. Half of Fisher's right leg was mutilated, stripped to the bone by some accounts, with his blood spilling all over the dock as he desperately clung to life. He was taken by train to the nearest hospital, where he died of severe blood loss. But the horrible summer of 1916 had not yet concluded. Only half an hour after the fatal attacks on Lester and Fisher, another group of boys were still enjoying the creek's cool water, unbeknownst of the tragedy that had just occurred only half a mile away. The three boys, including Michael Dunn and his younger brother Joseph Dunn, age 14, from New York City, were playing in the water when they heard a boat engine and a man shouting their way. It was old Captain Cottrell, who had previously reported seeing the shark, and whom the town had previously ignored. Cottrell wasn't close enough to the three boys to scoop them into his boat, but succeeded in warning them that there was a shark about, and they had to get out of the water. The first two boys successfully exited the creek, and got back onto the dock. But just as Joseph began to climb the dock's ladder, he was pulled beneath the surface, and the water began to turn red. His older brother Michael reached into the bloody water and managed to find Joseph's arm. 
he grabbed on and pulled with all of his might in what would later be described as a vicious, life-or-death tug-of-war with the shark as it continued to bite down and pull Joseph's leg. After a hard-fought struggle, Michael and his friend succeeded in pulling an unconscious Joseph out of the water. Joseph clung on to life, making it to the hospital in critical condition. And it was Joseph Dunn who would be the only survivor of the 1916 shark attacks. He spent two months recovering in the hospital before leaving and going home. In recounting his near-fatal encounter with the shark, Joseph stated that he could feel his leg going down the shark's throat and that he believed it would have swallowed him had his brother not stepped in. Not only did Joseph keep his leg, but miraculously, he was able to walk again despite the purple scars that would remind him for the rest of his life about the shark attack. On July 14th, two days after Madawan Creek had run red with human blood, the remains of young Lester Stilwell were found and finally recovered. Immediately after the final attack on Joseph Dunn took place on July 12th, another force of nature was released on Madawan Creek. Vengeful human fury. The creek became a hotbed of water geysers as locals dynamited the water profusely thinking this would surely destroy the killer shark that had claimed four lives and nearly a fifth. People flocked to the creek, armed with every type of firearm publicly available in the day. It was reported that by sundown on July 12, 1916, the entire town of Madawan had depleted their ammunition. This mass hysteria was captured in a media storm that rapidly spread and popularized the new and profound fear of killer sharks in America which, again, had been widely considered non-dangerous animals to humans before these events. Hundreds of sharks were killed in the nearby Atlantic waters of New Jersey and New York as fishermen sought to find and kill the man-eater. The town of Matawan also placed a $100 bounty on the creature responsible for the attacks, which equals over $2,500 in today's money. The individual shark responsible for the 1916 attacks, that is, assuming it was a single animal, was dubbed the Jersey Maneater by the press of the day. With countless fishermen, ship captains, and vengeful New Jersey residents now taking up the mantle of Shark Hunter, it would be one Michael Schleiser who would give the public as much closure as they'd ever get. Schleiser, a German-American who was a professional lion tamer and New York City taxidermist, caught a seven and a half foot long juvenile great white shark on July 14, 1916 in Raritan Bay, just several miles from the mouth of Matawan Creek. The huge fish weighed 325 pounds and nearly sank Schleiser in his boat before he was finally able to kill it with a broken oar. Schleiser cut the shark's belly open and discovered what he described as suspicious fleshy materials and bones, later identified by scientists as human remains. The shark's belly contained over 15 pounds of human flesh, along with what was thought to be the shin bone of a boy and part of a man's rib. No further shark attacks happened after Schleiser killed his great white. To this day, it's debated how many sharks were involved in the 1916 attacks, and what species. There is a very strong case for Schleiser's Great White having been responsible for some of, if not all, of the attacks. However, this has been called into question due to Great Whites tending not to do well or typically show up at all in brackish waters, those being mid-level salinity waters, saltier than fresh water, but less so than salt water. With this in mind, it has been suggested that the shark responsible for the 1916 attacks was actually a bull shark, which are both highly aggressive and are capable of living in a wide range of salinity levels, from saltwater to brackish and even outright freshwater. While aggressive, they are thought to have little interest in eating humans. However, the same could also be said for great whites, and it's clear that the 1916 attacks were very unusual circumstances of shark behavior, regardless of which species was actually responsible. 
although it should also be noted that the Matawan Creek attacks took place during a full moon, during which time there was high tide in the creek, and thus, more than double the usual salinity level, possibly raising the water's saltiness high enough for a great white to enter, albeit temporarily. Once more, the shark attacks were even blamed on German U-boats amid World War I, which America had yet to enter. An anonymous writer in a letter to the New York Times wrote, These sharks may have devoured human bodies in the waters of the German war zone, and followed liners to this coast, or even followed the Deutschland herself, expecting the usual toll of drowning men, women, and children. This would account for their boldness and their craving of human flesh. And again, the alternative theory of the attacks actually being the result of a giant sea turtle were raised. The summer 1916 shark attacks changed the public view of sharks in America and beyond, characterizing them as the cold, ruthless man-eaters they are widely infamous as today. This is, of course, also a result of the impact of Jaws, one of the most famous films ever made, which happened to be heavily inspired by the events of 1916. It's also my favorite film. Shark attacks, both fatal and non-fatal, do still occur even if they are far less likely to happen than many people think. In the United States, swimmers are 3,000 times more likely to drown than they are be bitten by a shark. And while the movie monster image of sharks, and of great whites in particular, has persisted over the years, fresh conservation efforts have also taken place and continue. Jaws author Peter Benchley actually became a major force for shark conservation after feeling deep guilt for the impact of his novel and its film adaptation, but that could be a whole video in and of itself. Today, the 1916 Jersey Coast shark attacks remain a morbid and unlikely tale, a perfect storm of shocking and improbable misfortune for those who lost their lives or were otherwise affected by the suffering that took place. Over a century later, this tale of aquatic horror persists and won't be forgotten anytime soon. Thank you so much for watching today's video. This is a format I'm still getting used to, and while I assure you that the classic text and music deep sea videos aren't going away, I'll be happy to make more of these narrated history videos if there's an appetite for them. Do you want to see more of these? Let me know in the comments, and feel free to check out the previous two narrated historical videos I've made if you haven't seen them yet. They're not exactly the most popular videos on this channel yet, but I'm a big history nerd and I love making these videos. Thanks again for watching. Until next time.